Welcome everyone to the worship of Sleaford Methodist Circuit. My name is Paul Coburn. I'm going to read two passages today, both set lessons for this particular Sunday. The connection between them, um, maybe, was chosen because both take part near a gate and by water, a river or a pool. Um, whether that's really significant, I'm not sure. Watch out for references to gates, rivers and pools. But the first lesson I'm going to read is from Acts chapter 16, and I'm reading verses 6 to 15. I'll also put up a map because a lot of the places that get mentioned will perhaps make more sense if you see a map. Not quite every place mentioned is on the map, but the key thing here is that this is the first moment when Paul and his companions left the continent of Asia and moved over to the continent of Europe, as we now call it. This is from Acts 16, verse 6. Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, slightly to the right of the centre in the map. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Thamathrace and the next day on to Neapolis, neither of those on the map. From there we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Thanks be to God. With the theme of rivers and baptism in mind, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that in you our sins are forgiven, your love for us enfolds us and surrounds us, no matter who we are or what we have done. We pray, Lord, that you will forgive our sins. We admit that we are not perfect. We have got things wrong time and time again. We have tried to serve you and failed. We have gone our own way rather than travelling your way. 
here and now, Lord. We admit our faults and pray for your forgiveness. Wash us clean. Wash away all the dirt that clings to us, all the grime and dust of this world's sin, and make us new and clean. Refresh us, Lord, with your living water. May your Spirit baptise us once more. May your love flow around us and through us, lifting us from the ordinary grime of life into the glorious holiness of your presence. Forgive us, Lord, and challenge us now to go out and serve you as we should. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. And we sing our prayer in the words uh, of this next song, River, wash over me. Let's sing together. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and verses 1 to 9. And again, things take place just outside a gate, or maybe inside a gate, and by a pool of water. Though perhaps there are more significant connections with the previous passage that I will draw your attention to. Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralysed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, 
someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mats and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. I should just point out a footnote in my Bible that some less reliable manuscripts put an extra verse in about the people who were waiting for the moving of the water. And it says, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. I mention that because that will perhaps make more sense as to why the man was saying, no one helps me into the pool when the water is stirred. Sometimes I read a commentary uh, on a passage of scripture and I don't entirely agree with it, or at least if I do agree with it, I think it only goes part way. And I want to argue with the commentator or at least enter into a conversation and say, yes, but yes. And what about this other point of view as well? And a couple of times in reading a commentary on this passage, I found myself wanting to do the same thing. Well, I can't debate with the person who wrote the commentary. I, I don't know them. I've never met them, but I can share my thoughts with you. And just two thoughts, really, although they, they are related. One is that uh, one of the commentators pointed out that the, the disturbance of the water uh, in this pool may well have been due to some kind of underground spring. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been uh, in a, a place where the, the surface of the water was bubbling away or moving in some shape or form uh, without any apparent um, flow of a, of a stream through it. There's a, um, a lovely village near us called Scopwick. Many of you watching this will know where I mean. It's got a stream running through it, but there is, there's one particular pool within that where if, if you look at it, uh, at times, you know, the, the water's moving. There's some spring, I believe, underneath, and the water bubbles up. And maybe this pool in or near Jerusalem was uh, such a, a pool that at certain times, due, due to the weather or the recent rainfall or whatever, uh, at certain times, uh, water from a hidden spring would come into the pool and the, the surface would be disturbed. And they interpreted it as an angel disturbing the water. Now, the commentator who pointed this out may well have been right. But yet it's not the full story. It's all very good to say, oh, well, it was um, a hidden spring that disturbed the water, not an angel. Why could it not have been both? In uh, one of the Narnia stories, the, the children from this world go into Narnia where things are very different and they, they meet a, a star, uh, not a shining star up in the sky, but someone who looks like a human being, uh, but at the same time was a star from the sky, come down to meet with them. And one of the children says, well, in my world, stars are, are just huge balls of, of flaming gas. And the Narnian star responds with, even in your world, that's not what a star is, only what it's made of. Just because we can describe something in physical terms and, and explain it scientifically, doesn't mean that that's all there is to say. And who knows what the natural phenomena may have been that made this pool bubble up from time to time. That doesn't stop it also being the work of God. The people who were there clearly had this strong belief that when this 
happened when the water was moved that the first person in would be healed, cured of their disease. One man had been ill for 38 years. It doesn't actually tell us he'd spent all those years waiting by the pool. So perhaps that's an assumption, I don't know. But certainly he'd been there long enough to be able to say, when it happens, I can never get there first. Other people get there before me because of uh, my injuries. I, you know, I can't get there fast enough. Nobody's there to help me. But he has, had witnessed it happening and there wasn't any sense of, well, I saw it happen and, and the person wasn't healed, so it was all a bit pointless. He still clung to that belief that the first person in the pool was healed of their disease and he'd been there long enough to be able to test that out. Something must have been going on, more than just a moving of the waters, a moving of the spirit, the work of God, people's lives being transformed and changed. What's disturbing the waters of your life? Maybe it is routine things that you can explain away. Or maybe it is that and God at work. Our passage from Acts talked about Paul and his companions trying to get into various places to preach the gospel and the Spirit wouldn't let them. Now, I can't imagine for a moment that that meant a great hand came down from heaven and blocked them off and said, no, you can't go this way. I imagine that the, there were normal everyday reasons why they weren't able to travel where they wanted. Uh, the ancient equivalent of the leaves on the line or the wrong kind of snow that made travel impossible. Who knows what it was? That there were no camel trains going in the right direction. Um, there was a, a storm that stopped them. Who knows? But the way Paul interpreted these things were, was, this is the spirit telling us something, telling us no to that particular place and telling us to wait for something else. And in a vision, the answer came. Someone from Macedonia saying, come over to us, we need to hear the gospel. And that's where they went. You can explain these things in natural terms, but God works through those things. So I say again, what's disturbing the waters of your life? What is, is stirring things up that you can explain in natural ways? But is God also saying something? Is God closing some doors, opening other doors? Is God trying to get through to you in some way? It's not enough just to explain what goes on in this world in, in purely scientific terms. It's fun to do that. And there are lots of people uh, who, uh, who are very clever people who can explain all kinds of uh, weird and wonderful phenomena. But as Christians, we also need to say, where's God at work in this? What is God doing and what's God saying to us? And then there is a, another part of that same commentary that I, I wanted to come back to and, and say, yes, yes, you've got a point, but, but. And that's, uh, the commentator said, this idea of an angel now and then stirring up the waters and just one person being healed at that moment, and then that was it. And then you had to wait until the waters were disturbed again. What an awful view of God that was. The sort of God who just now and then healed one person. And I wanted to say yes and look at what Jesus is doing in this incident. Jesus goes to a pool where a lot of people, blind and lame, disabled people, people with diseases, are all waiting and hoping for the water to move. And Jesus identifies one person who's been there a long time and heals him. 
enables him to walk, pick up your mats, pick up your bed, walk, and he does. Jesus heals one person. We're not told that he, he went around all the disabled and blind and lame people who were there, healing them all one by one. He healed a single person. What's that about? Is our God the sort of God who just heals one person now and then? Well, look at the evidence around you. It is not true that God heals all diseases, all illnesses, all injuries brought about by accident. God does not heal everyone. I mean, I state that as a, a fact that is very easily verified. Just look around you. There are people who are not healed by God. But that doesn't mean the opposite. It doesn't mean that God therefore heals nobody. And if you are prepared to uh, use your eyes of faith to see what is going on, you'll realise that there are times when miraculous healings happen, or at least I believe they are. There are times when God works in marvellous ways. So it's not that he heals everybody. It's not that he heals nobody. He heals some people. What's that about? And I would say, far from seeing that as an unusual feature of, of God's healing, it's actually pretty much what we ought to expect. I can explain this best by taking you back uh, to World War II and Bletchley Park. You, you've, I'm sure, heard of it. Uh, it's the place where they worked to break the codes that were used during uh, the Second World War. The Germans had a, a, a clever machine called the Enigma machine, and they believed that that would encode messages in a way that could not be broken. No one could unscramble the code, uh, not without the machine and all the, uh, the codes that went with it. But they were wrong because there were some very clever people at Bletchley Park who were able to crack the code. So when uh, all the radio messages came in, they were taken to Bletchley Park and the people there would work out what they said. So that each day before long, um, the, the government could be informed um, exactly what was being said uh, by the Germans in their radio messages. And just to focus on one aspect of the war, uh, they knew, for example, the movement of U-boats in the Atlantic, uh, where the U-boats were, where they were intending to go, uh, what they were intending to attack, and so on. But the government then had a dilemma. What to do with that information? They could use it to save all the Atlantic shipping. Just tell everyone where the U-boats were and how to avoid them and that would really help. The problem was that if the government did that every day, it wouldn't take the Germans long to realise that the code was broken, that the, the Allies knew exactly where they were and, and uh, how they were moving around, and they'd, they'd realise the Enigma machine is not... Uh, as, as foolproof as we thought. The code's been broken, so they'd stop using the Enigma machine, they'd find a different way of communicating. The British and their allies would be back to square one without any idea of what the Germans were doing. So they, they didn't want to act on all the information they had in order to save all the shipping. A very difficult decision because although it would have helped in the short term, longer term, it, it would have done nothing and just put things back to square one. But they didn't need to go to the opposite extreme of doing nothing, because that would have meant it was useless having the information at all. What they were able to do 
was use the information they had to save some ships, to, to help in some way. Not enough that the Germans became suspicious, but enough to do some good to some people and to save some lives. So there was a balance to be achieved. What could they do that, that would actually help certain people, certain shipping, uh, certain convoys, without doing it so much that it gave the game away? Now, you might think that doesn't have any parallel with God working. I mean, why would God not want to give the game away about his healing power? But the fact is, if you think about a world that in which God healed every person, a world in which God cured all diseases, mended all wounds, stopped all pain, overcame all injury and disability. Think of a world like that. Imagine what it would be like. It would be a great world in many respects, but it would be a very different world to the one that we, we know and the one we live in. We wouldn't need hospitals. We wouldn't need doctors or nurses. We wouldn't need medical research. We wouldn't need health and safety. What's the point of trying to avoid disease if God's going to cure the disease? What's the point of trying to teach our children to be careful when they cross the road, learn the Green Cross Code, or whatever the modern equivalent is uh, of, of road safety? What's the point? Because if you get knocked down, well, God will cure you. God will mend your injury. God will heal your disease. It would be a very different kind of world where I think we'd become lazy. We wouldn't do any exploration ourselves. What's the point of medical research if God just cures everything? There'd be no people uh, getting curious about the human body and the way it works because we wouldn't need to. God will look after us. It would be a, a radically different world to the world we have. And God has clearly chosen not to heal every disease, to cure every illness. But that doesn't mean he doesn't do it sometimes. It doesn't mean he's sitting back and doing nothing. Sometimes he heals. Sometimes he cures people. Jesus cured this one man, enabled him to walk. God, through the Spirit, stopped Paul preaching to one particular part of the, the, the world, but said, I want you to go to a different part. There, one lady was uh, enabled by the Spirit to hear and respond to Paul's message. One of the crowd, we don't know about the others, but one of them at least, the Spirit moved in her heart, opened up her ears, and she heard and responded to the message. In the end, the Spirit is at work in, in all these ways. I don't know why some people are healed and some people are not healed. I don't think I will ever know. I don't think you will ever know. I am sure it's not to do with simply, do we have enough faith? It's not um, a, something that we can determine by just summoning up the right amount of faith and it'll happen. It's down to the work of the Spirit. Those occasions in the Bible where disciples of Jesus say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk, and it happens, I am convinced that they only say that because the Spirit enables them to say it. The Spirit is the one that, that's saying, this person's going to be healed, tell them so. I don't believe that we can manufacture that ourselves. So what do we do? What's the, the point of all this? The point is that we need to both work for healing and pray for healing. We need our hospitals, we need our doctors and nurses, we need our medical researchers. We need the ordinary care of ordinary people in terms of our mental health and our mental well-being. Simply talking to people, encouraging them, giving them hope, befriending them, does a lot to help 
people's in their mental health. We can do that and should do that. And if we have the skills and the expertise, we can do a lot more in terms of medical research or first aid skills or becoming a doctor. That There's a lot we can do in practical terms and should do. But alongside that, we can also pray because God does sometimes amaze us with miraculous moments of healing, miraculous interventions where he'll step in and, and transform lives. You've probably heard this before, but in terms of whether we act or pray, we do both. We act as if everything depended on us and not on God. We pray as if everything depended on God and not on us. We do both. It's not an either or, because God does sometimes step in and sometimes he doesn't. And therefore we need to act and we need to be open to where the Spirit's at work and responding when the Spirit prompts us to act. Pray and act in the name of Christ. Let us pray right now for the needs of the world. Lord God, there are many needs in this broken world, sickness and disease, as well as pain caused through injury and violence. There is the disease of the mind. People are suffering through loneliness, through bereavement, through fear and depression. Lord, help us to make this world the kind of place where these things do not happen. Help us to find ways to bring healing to those who are sick, to bring comfort to those who are disturbed, to bring peace to those who have no peace. Lord, help us to do this and step in, Lord, with your help too. Where we fall short, bring your healing, bring your peace. We pray, Lord, for the nations of the world and especially at this time we continue to pray for Ukraine. We pray for those close to us, friends who are unwell and in need of our support and our prayers. Give them comfort and strength. And we pray for your church, Lord, that you will bless us and use us to do your work. Pour out your spirit upon us, we pray. All this we ask in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And we're going to sing again. God is working his purpose out. I, I thought of this because of the last line of each verse about uh, the water covering the sea. And I started right at the beginning with a, a mention that some of these stories happened by the riverside or by the poolside. So water was on my mind, but actually it's not just the last line. There is so much in this hymn that picks up uh, probably in, in better ways than I've tried to express it, the way that God is active in today's world. God is working his purpose out. Let's sing together.
cover the sea. What can we do to work God's work to prosper and And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit now rest upon you and remain with you evermore. Amen.